Joe Cullen and Layla Burgess both worked on the Hemlock Willie Adelgid project. And Joe, um, tell us, with those of us who love to summer in the mountains, um, started seeing horrible things when we got there because our hemlocks were dying. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit of what happened that, um, that caused that. Okay. Um, we have a, a map we can show behind us to see the uh, spread of the infestation, but this um, pest, the hemlock Willie Adelgid, is actually accidentally introduced from Japan um, in the early 1950s into central Virginia. Um, from there, it started spreading north, and we thought maybe we'd be so in good luck. Here's the map. We can see Here's that. the map. You can see the Move spread in the first. northeast uh -huh. up through like northern Virginia and yes. Pennsylvania and New uh -huh. York. Um, and then once we got into uh, probably the latter part of the 1990s and early 2000s, it moved down, started moving down the south. You'll see the red colors coming on here in a minute, oh, um, where it started moving through North Carolina, um, Virginia into South Carolina, and over into Tennessee and Kentucky and things. And causing um, death of... And causing death of the hemlocks. The, particularly the, the big, beautiful, older ones, I believe. Right. The first. pest um, feeds on the needles in the trees, and it, it does defoliate the trees and kill them. Layla, yes, what sir. was the importance of hemlocks I mean, that was one of the major, most predominant trees in the forest, and, and how does it interact with the animals and other things that are in it's that area? It's not a current timber species, but it's a very ecologically important tree yes. species. It's aesthetically pleasing. It provides a lot of recreation areas and riparian zones. So it really provides a great environment for people to, to visit and enjoy while they're out in the woods. And the dense or canopy means that you could walk under it. I mean. Sure, sure. <laughs> it creates a unique uh, for, forest floor. And how about the fact that it's evergreen? Does that mean that animals would shelter in it and sure, perhaps most find of food our, sources? Most of our trees do lose their leaves in the wintertime, but it's something that stays out there, stays green, provides cones, seed, and habitat, and nesting grounds. And then how about its influence on the trout? That's such a people, when you talk about recreation, mm -hmm. I yes. think so many people enjoy that. A lot of people do enjoy trout fishing, and of course our trout fish, um, they feed on aquatic insects, and so those are predominantly found a lot of times in the edge of our streams and rivers where hemlocks do overhang, providing shade and some temperature lowering. Cooling the water a little yes, bit, which mm -hmm. the trout find very important. They like that. Um, as an in, people involved in entomology and looking at things, mm -hmm. when, we, when you see something like this, I guess there, there's kind of a two-prong approach, you said. So mm -hmm. there was an, a pest actually using a chemical to control mm -hmm. it, and then you also started looking at where the tree, where the insect came from. So talk about both of those approaches, please. Okay. Um, for for large-scale kinds of things, like a national forest, the Appalachian Mountains, those kind of things, um, biological control is the, the best approach because you don't have to carry pesticides into Certainly. the forest. Um, what we used with this, because there weren't many natural predators here, uh, we went back to where they were originally from in Japan, and that was started by the Connecticut Experiment Station, because that's where it went first. Certainly. And uh, they brought some predators back. They went through a quarantine lab to make sure they didn't eat good things. And then our lab and some other labs like Georgia and Tennessee started rearing predators to release into the forest. And so on the large scale, forest scale kind of things, uh, we would use biological control. Um, homeowners or around like headquarters buildings uh -huh. for parks and campgrounds and picnic kind areas. Kind of iconic areas. Right, yeah. where you have Specimen potential trees. hazard yeah. trees, you know, where, where you don't want them dropping limbs on people. Um, they would go in and use chemical control, and the, the two chemicals that work best right now are both neonicotinoids, um, dinotefuran and imidacloprid, and they're best applied or easiest applied as either soil drenches or now you can actually get them in a, a pelletized kind of form. Um, that you can put out around the tree, and then the trees actually do the work, and they pick the insecticide up and take it up to the needles. But there's no way we can do that to millions and millions of trees. You, you yeah. can't. No, it's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. You can't get out in the forest yeah. because it works very well, but you can't cover the well, whole Layla, Appalachians. Well, you've got an example of a hemlock branch that yes. shows exactly how it looked when yes, it's we active. Have. So let's talk about that and talk about how it damaged the, the trees a little more. Mm -hmm. So this is actual hemlock with hemlock willy adulgid on it. We call it HWA It's for a very, short. very small it's insect, very, isn't it? very, very hard Tiny. to see. So that's why we kind of have this model here that shows us really in large scale what adelgids would look like and how they would attach to the tree. And then what we have represented here with the dark masses are predator beetles that feed on the adelgid. And then hopefully by reducing adelgid numbers, we can help these hemlocks recover and thrive. So you then were involved at that time with the research programs that were going on at Clemson and mm -hmm. still are, and mm -hmm. had to look, find money because we needed to actually raise these predator beetles. Right. We, we've had multiple funding sources from the Forest Service to conservation groups to the National Forest Foundation. 
um, that collectively have put about a million and a half dollars into this project at Clemson, along with the other labs, um, over the last 15 years. And um, it's been very, very successful, I think. We've been doing very well. You have some pictures, I think, that show people in the lab. Can yes, you talk a little bit about it was not an easy thing to do? No, and no. We've been, we were at it for about 14 years. This first photo shows how we bring uh, Dulgid in from the forest system into the lab so because we can process it. Because you have to it. have the actual insect there you do. for this beetle to complete the life yes, cycle. Yes, ma'am. You have to rear these beetles out so they have to go from egg to adult. So you have to have something that they can feed on. This is processing hemlock, um, getting it ready to use for different phases of rearing. This is breaking down what we call oviposition jars. It's basically just making eggs so we can actually rear those eggs into adults. This is somewhat of establishing the larval cages and the feeding cages where we actually do that process. And then those, phages, those cages had to be fed over time. Like I say, for one beetle, it takes about 30 days and we would Gosh. have to do, do that on a routine of feeding. Um, then we also collected the, all the beetles uh, by mouth, by mouth aspiration. And um, we produced about a million ST beetles, Sasachiskin misugi. We called it Sassy as an endearment. Um, and about 70,000 Larry, Laricobius nigrinus. So you've got several things that kind of show us a little bit. Mm -hmm. This was the bouquet you used, so let's look, talk about it. And mm -hmm. then we'll get to that fun okay. suck it up machine. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this Hold is, it a, still, this is yeah. a bouquet that we use in our overposition jars. Um, we put males and females in a rearing jar for about seven days. They mate, produce lots of eggs that we put into the cage that we saw there and rear those eggs into adults. And, and, that, on the and we have to have actual adelgids in those cages for yes, these insects to feed upon. Yes, we so there was a constant, you in. had to go out and find them and bring them in. Right, mm -hmm. we had to go out in the woods and, and bring them back. And then we <laughs> made these little bouquets, they went into these gallon jars um, to lay eggs. And then they would take the eggs out, which are on the gauze pads, Yes. Um, put them in the larger cages, mm -hmm. like behind yeah, Layla here. Yeah, unless they had a picture of that larger cage, cage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, This is a rearing tent that we would use. Right, and mm -hmm. that, that would have hemlock with the delges on it so the larvae could feed on that and, and become adults. And then how did you use the aspirator to get those insects? Mm -hmm. this is a mouth Everybody's <laughs> found this fascinating. We all want to see this. This is a mouth aspirator. You put, your, put it in your mouth and uh -huh. you suck. And obviously this tube here is open. So if we had beetles or something that we wanted to get into this vial, we just suck them up. Do that again there, slowly they so, they can, so the camera can see it. Okay. And Layla didn't okay. want to say this, but entomologists call those pooters. 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 <laughs> P-O-O-T-E-R. Pooters. They do indeed. And so the <clears> insects <throat> yes. fall into the glass tube yes, and don't come into your mouth. Exactly. Okay. Well, there's a little screen so in here that, that keeps them coming into your mouth. So that is how you had to collect mouth. these mm -hmm. insects. That is a just million a, beetles a by million mouth beetles aspiration. by mouth. Mm -hmm. right. Well, then once you got them, well, right. how did you get them out into the forest? Then they went into these lovely rearing containers here to <laughs> deliver them to Fancy. the forest. Ice cream <laughs> really, cartons. Really, just an ice cream carton. Just card, an old yeah. ice cream carton. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, you'd put about 2,500 beetles in there, and you'd take it to the release site, and you would basically sprinkle them around on the trees with the adelgids at where you wanted to do releases. So nationwide, many millions were reared, but in our laboratory that you received the funding mm -hmm. for and you ran, mm -hmm. we had over a million? Mm -hmm. Of the one beetle, uh -huh. yes, and then we did a, we did rear a second beetle, Laricobius, and about seventy thousand of those because they're a little bit different to rear. They must their, be harder. Their life cycle mm -hmm. involves a whole lot more than the ST uh -huh. beetle. But both have been are showing some success. So, what right. do you feel? I mean, I love the hemlocks. What do you mm -hmm. feel like the the long term hope is? Well, I think I think it's positive in the long term. Um, when we first started meeting with some of the, especially some of the private groups that were providing matching funds for some of the other grants. We were telling them, you know, th this is our best bet, and we probably aren't going to see success for eight to ten or twelve years. And so we're because the 10 population or 12 years had out, to grow and grow. Because you had to grow. build the population, and because we had a lot of large hemlocks with lots of adelgids on oh. them, when we started putting 2,500 beetles yeah. on a tree, there might have been they a million only, adelgids. Yeah. And they so could only eat so much. They can, have it to takes establish. a while to catch up. You have to um, establish and build up numbers. Right, but two, at control. least two of the species of predators are established in the southeast, actually through the Appalachians now. So when you go out, you can now find them. You know you can that go out and there. find them. Uh -huh. yeah, you can them. find both species. And um, they, they seem to be holding their own. Now that we have smaller trees, unfortunately, the big trees have yeah. taken a pretty good hit. But the smaller trees that are out there have adelgids on them, but the trees look good. And so hopefully they'll continue to look good and the predators will keep up with the adelgid population 
because we're not going to get rid of the adelgid. Mm -hmm. it, it'll never go away yeah. now. We're looking um, for a balance. Yeah, Hemlocks, adelgids, and predator beetles that control. So if we can achieve what was achieved in Japan and some of the other countries where the adelgids and the hemlocks mm -hmm. evolved, at the where same the predators time, were native there, yeah. yeah. Then we feel like if the environment, if we get enough rain and the trees can stay healthy, mm -hmm. yeah. Then hopefully we'll have hemlocks back in the forest for <sighs> probably our grandchildren. I sure hope that happens. <laughs> I Layla, hope so. If people want to know more about the wonderful work that y'all have done and what's going on, um, tell us if there's some places where we can go to yeah, look at the Yeah, you can go online and look at the USDA Forest Service. If you um, put in the search word or keyword hemlock woolly delgid or just HWA, it'll take you right to it. I want to mm -hmm. thank y'all for what y'all did. Um, I want to have many more wonderful walks in the mountains, and I want I to hope. I want to see those hemlocks when I'm there. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, they're looking good. Mm -hmm.